This is episode number 582 of the Inner Fight Podcast. Welcome back to another edition of the show. As always, thank you to our show sponsors, Smith Street Paleo. Please do hop over there, check out all the good food that they've got on offer, meal plans delivered directly to you, loads of recipes that you can cook at home. I said this in the last show, I know it's quite revolutionary to go to the grocery store these days, buy some ingredients and follow a recipe, but that's definitely an option that you can take. If you don't want to take that option, jump on a meal plan. Hello at Smith Street Paleo. Those guys would love to hear from you. Welcome back to today's show. Thanks a lot to everyone who's joined in from around the world. And no matter where you're listening, if you're listening during your workout or if you're listening on the way to work, please drive safely. Or if you've just sit down to focus purely on this show, that's absolutely awesome as well. Some of you might know this guy's name, Yanni Brakovic. We met a few years ago. We were introduced by a friend of ours. Spent a lot of time talking to each other on the bike. So it only makes sense that I brought him in during some of the small times that he's here in Dubai and we had a conversation in person. This guy's got a lot to share. Let's hope I can open a little bit up in today's show. As I always say, no matter where you are in the world, thank you so much for downloading the show and I hope you enjoy this one. Yanni, welcome to the Inner Fight Podcast. Hello, hello. I'm nervous. You're like the podcast master. You listen to hours of this stuff. I listen to it, yeah, but... Uh I think I'm nervous more than you are. <laughs> mate, I'm sure, I'm sure you've got a lot to share. Give us, to kick us off, mate, it'd be cool if you sort of just give the listeners a little bit of background. Who are you? What do you do? Where you're from? Because I don't want to balls it up. I'm from Slovenia. I've been a professional cyclist since 2006, so quite a while. Um, raced for quite a few world tour teams, so top level teams. Yeah. Um, and now I'm here in Dubai. Actually, I've been uh, a resident of uh, UAE for nine, uh, nine years now. So um, Tax evasion. Love it. <laughs> <laughs> Not really, but Strate- yeah. Strategic yeah. position. <laughs> Mate, let's jump back. You said there you've been a professional cyclist since sort of 2006, 2004? Six. 2006. Yeah, six. Tell us, mate, because... I, I, the world of cycling to a lot of people is a little bit unknown. We see, obviously, we saw a lot of Lance Armstrong really kind of put cycling on the map for the wrong reason. Everyone knows the Tour de France. But I want to dig back a little bit. How did you get into cycling? How did it all start? Well, it started quite uh, quite late uh, when I was, I think, 17. Yeah. I had a schoolmate. Um, he was training. He was a racer. And um, I tried it a little bit. On um, I rode on his bike, and yeah. I loved it. So really? uh, this is how it all be- began, and uh, it was really hard for the first uh, couple of years. I had no um, no history of uh, doing any sports. Um, I was wow. uh, underdeveloped. I was at the time I was thirty six kilos and one fifty. Wow! In so how old were you? Seventeen. Seventeen years yeah. old. Wow. Well, so you must have been, I mean, that would have been crazy. Like everyone as a teenager is, is, is growing and you're still, you're really small. Yeah, I was, I was really small and I, I didn't have any, any um, technical capabilities. I knew how to um, ride in a group, uh, what to do on the bike, um, how to race, nothing. So in the first year, first few races, um, I was the first one to be, uh, to be dropped from the group and did uh, the race uh, by myself. Uh, really? Yeah. What was it when you, you said you got on the bike and you were just like, wow, this is for me? What was it? What was the sort of catalyst? What was the turning point there? What, what, what did you feel? Well, in the beginning, it was just the speed. Uh, the, the difference between a normal bike or mountain bike yeah. um, to a road bike. A road bike on a on the road is really fast. Yeah. Uh, so that was the thing. And then when I started riding more, um, it was just that feeling of freedom, uh, just riding without without the reason just to be out there yeah. and, and feel free. Was it the first sport that you, like if, you, if you're a little bit underdeveloped in, in, in your youth, was it the first sport that, did you feel like maybe you could express yourself in a way or that a sport that you could, that maybe your size wasn't a barrier for? Actually, it's an advantage, which we'll get to later. But did that play something into it, mate? I think uh, if I look back um, also now uh, that 
uh, most of professional athletes yeah. uh, start their sport for, for a reason. Uh, that reason is to, to feel better about themselves, to feel, um, to be seen, to, uh, to have a purpose and uh, to be noticed by other people. Because um, uh, I had a pretty, pretty rough childhood, and uh, I was bullied a lot, uh, and, and these things. So uh, cycling gave me some sort of relief, uh, feeling of being somebody, uh, yeah. somebody more, uh, more respected. Which I think, if we, I mean, and this is this is maybe a little bit off topic, but we're talking about it when we're riding this morning. Maybe people are. Still now, people search for that, what actually is the meaning to them of life and to existence. We're talking about it when people change their, their <laughs> which was obviously, it's massively on topic at the moment, but we're talking about when people are changing their Instagram bio to state who they are, whether it's based on a diet they follow or whether, and we use my example of, you know, I've written in my bio, I run 30 marathons, you know, and it, it gives us a sense of, of belonging. And of, of feeling and of, of worth. So this is what cycling was doing to you. Exactly, exactly. It's, uh, it was totally my uh, identity. And everybody knew me as a cyclist. Uh, then a few years after when I became a world champion, everybody knew me as the first Slovenian world champion. Yeah. And uh, that meant a lot for me. But uh, I think um, being a cyclist and and being your identity as a cycling is uh, on the long term uh, probably not the best um, best thing because uh, sooner or later your career is going to be over yeah and when it's over then then you're left with nothing yeah uh, you're not a cyclist anymore and you have no idea who you are <laughs> and um, luckily um, I became aware of that uh, a couple of years ago, and uh, I'm slowly starting to to work on myself and and uh, continue my my path, my uh, purpose uh, after after my my career. Yeah, I heard you're quite interested in bodybuilding. Is that is that? Do you think that's a natural next step? Yes, that's definitely <laughs> what. Uh, <laughs> no. Mate, you've skipped to the end of the career, but let's go back to the start because you mentioned it just before. You were the world champion at under 23 time trial, which, like, that must be huge, mate. Talk us through how that came to pass and, 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 and what that meant to you as well. Well, it meant a lot and still means a lot. Um, well, it started uh, that year, 2004, uh, because I wasn't a, a TT rider at yeah. all. Yeah. Uh, I was pretty strong but uh, not a TT rider. So uh, one of the guys who was supposed to do the world championships in, uh, for Slovenia uh, crashed earlier in the year and broke his collarbone and had all these complications with healing and everything. So right. they decided uh, maybe I should try and, and see how it goes. And yeah. that, that's how it started. Uh, started training specifically for the time trial uh, for a couple of months, um, did the national championships, won by two minutes, and then we went uh, on and I did the uh, European championships, which I believe I finished second or third. Wow. And then it just, things kept uh, getting better and better, and uh, I wasn't a favorite for the Worlds, but I knew that I was capable of really big things, and uh, it worked out. I won by... I think just about 20 seconds. So. Uh, Wikipedia says 18, but Wikipedia also lies sometimes. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> putting, putting things up. Mate, you, you, you see, when you said, when you're talking about how that process went, you've got an incredible amount of confidence. Now, it's quite a contrast for me because the start of the show, we're talking about, you know, you were underdeveloped at 17, you were 36 kilos, you had a tough childhood, you were bullied. But now you're, you're ooze, and now even today you ooze a lot of confidence. How did that confidence start to come? Was it the bike? I mean, how did it all start to come through? Uh, I would disagree, actually, to be honest. Uh, throughout my life, I was always uh, an introvert. I was afraid to talk to people. Um, 
I was uh, I was scared of uh, what other people were talking about me, thinking about me. So I never wanted to talk to anybody and uh, never want to. I didn't uh, I didn't want to 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 be in public that much. And um, to the extent that's still true, but. Uh, through the years, uh, I've learned a lot, and uh, I think I'm much more confident now. But um, to go back in uh, 2004, uh, the fact is that when all things start to go well, that you also get a yeah. lot of confidence, and, yeah. and uh, when you get start getting good results, you get more confident, and so on, and so on. And uh, at the end of the year, I was I was pretty sure I was um, capable of uh, getting a medal, but um, to be honest, I, I didn't thought, I didn't think, think about uh, the first place. Time trial, road bikes, the difference, obviously, folks, if you're wondering what event we're talking about, the time trial bikes are generally the ones where these guys are tucked down, elbows down, full aero position, similar to what you see in triathlon. These these parts, Tour de France, is, is raced on a what we generally call a road bike. However, mate, I want to dig into a little bit the, the World Time Trial Championships, you rode it in a time of like 46 minutes, so for about an hour. How does it work? How does the distance work? How far did you go in that time? What's the, what's the breakdown of that particular race? So it's usually, from year to year, it changes. Right. So for uh, under 23 um, riders, it's probably up to an hour long. Uh, for professionals, it's um, over an hour, right. so 50, 50 kilometers plus, uh-huh. uh, under 23, 10, 15 kilometers less. Right. Um, but when uh, when we're talking about Grand Tours and other stage races, it, it, it depends. Right. It's whatever organizer uh, has in his mind or um, whoever pays for hosting that time trial, right. that's, that's how it's... Uh, um, it's been decided and throughout the years time trials got uh, shorter and shorter and now at the Tour de France if we if we watch it's um, it's 25 30 35 kilometers yeah. 10 years ago we had 60 uh, yeah. time trials so right what's it like though mate because your your average time when, when you won was 46 kilometers an hour which for those that drive Ferraris is not very fast but for those that ride bicycles, it is incredibly fast. So even if the time, and when these races are shorter, the speeds generally we see maybe a little bit higher. It's all in for that time period, for the distance. It's probably the biggest test of buffering pain that you could have because it's painful for the whole time. Can you describe it a little bit to us and how you, how you get through it and how you become the world champion? <laughs> Yeah, I mean, you get used to it. Uh, <laughs> basically, uh, preparing for the time trial, uh, you get exposed to this uh, level of pain and you know what you're capable of uh, of enduring or uh, what you're capable of, um, of of doing for 45, 50, 60 minutes. Yeah. And uh, you immediately know at the start, after couple minutes you know where the limit is so you 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 try to sustain that <coughs> momentum um and uh, the level of pain for for the whole race um, and that's about it it's 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 just about managing the pain uh the pain's always going to be there but uh um you have to deal with it i'm sure we're going to talk a little bit more about pain as your career moved on mate 2004 became 2005 and that's when you joined your first pro team, I think, right? Yeah, in the August of 2005, uh, I started racing with uh, Discovery Channel at the time, and that was pretty, pretty nice experience. Uh, well, it, it must have been. <laughs> I love how you're just so casual about it. Yeah, I just joined Discovery Team, who at that time in in, in that era had had become had been the U.S. Postal Team, who were one of the strongest cycling teams in the world. And then this 23-year-old who's just won the world championships just casually joins Team Discovery. <laughs> yeah, it was uh, at that time it was unheard of, uh, especially yeah. for uh, for a Slovenian. Uh, we never before that that year we never had a 
any professional actually um, in the in the top top uh, world tour team. Uh, we had a couple guys racing for Italian uh, teams, really good teams, but not yeah. not the level of uh, Discovery Channel. So how did it happen? How did you? Why did you get picked? How did how did the whole thing happen? So honestly, um, at the end of the worlds. Um, at that time, keep in mind, there was no social media. Yeah. Uh, even emails were yeah, rare, rare. It's pretty much um, just Facebook had just kicked off, I think. Yeah, but maybe. 2005. Maybe. Yeah. So what happened was I was supposed to ride for another Italian team. Right. And <coughs> I had a pre-contract or something like that, which was not really... <laughs> <laughs> worth anything yeah yeah <laughs> yeah uh and then back in uh, november of 2004 johan uh, at that time general manager of uh, discover channel um called my uh team director uh expressing uh, a wish to to sign me right and they actually stalled it for a couple months they did not tell me uh, really yeah, so they finally figured out that this is quite a big deal. So they told me. Yeah. And uh, we organized a meeting. Uh, I did a test with them in Belgium, I believe. And yeah. uh, that was it. After the test, they said, okay. Uh, so Discovery contacted your current team. They said they were interested in you. And I don't know how deep we can get into how messed up cycling is, but they told them that you're inter they're interested and they don't tell you for two months. Exactly. And this is the biggest team in the world. Exactly. Insane. Yeah. <laughs> Insane. Yeah. <laughs> it's just, it's phenomenal, isn't it? And yeah. I, yeah. Guess, I guess 15 years ago it, it was, things were different, and, but I don't think it's too much different than today. Anyway, we might get into more of the dirty talk of cycling later on, but for the time being, folks may know or may not know Team Discovery was the team of Lance Armstrong, which is, as we said earlier, a household name in cycling, in drugs, and in a lot of different things now. As a 23 or 24-year-old at the time, aside from joining the biggest team in the world, what was it like to start working with, and maybe you tell us how it goes for Lance Armstrong? Well, uh, so I joined the team 2005 in... August, but he finished his career 2005 right. July after the tour. Right. So I I did not race with him. Right. But uh, early in that year, um, they made me go to the training camp of uh, Discovery Channel. So I yeah. met him there and I rode with him, and uh, I wasn't very comfortable with riding with these guys because you were of faster course, than them. <laughs> Some of them, yeah, yeah. I was faster. <laughs> We've had uh, this. But, yeah, as I said before, I was very, uh, very shy person, very yeah. uh, insecure. And uh, I was mostly just observing and doing what they, what they told me. Yeah. Is it like that in cycling, mate? You have to do what you're told? I don't think that's, that's the thing um, these days. But back in the day, it was... So more experienced riders had way more respect and uh, they could tell other young riders what to do and what not to do and make fun of them and, and yeah. do crazy stuff with them. So how was it? Let's, I mean, I, I think people are probably interested to know you trained a bit with Armstrong. We see in the media that he's put over as not being a very nice person through all the scandal. How was it to ride with him? I remember you telling me once a story where you actually smashed him in, 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 in a climb. What's, give, us, give us something that people are going to be interested in, in listening to, mate. Yeah, Make my show good. <laughs> there's a lot of negative talk uh, about Lance, and rightfully so. But yeah. uh, uh, when I was on his team, he always made sure that his riders were taken care of. Yeah. Always. And there's one thing that I will never forget. It was January 22nd that year. And I talked to him during the ride and et cetera, et cetera. And I was like, oh, I think my mother has a birthday today. And he was like, really? 
and he gave me his cell phone to call her wow. at that time. Wow. Like, call her now. Really? Yeah. And we didn't have cell phones. I yeah, didn't have yeah, cell phones. Of course <laughs> not. Yeah. So that, that really, that's really something that uh, I think was really nice of him. Yeah. Um, and yeah, but we all know what happened to him and, and how the things went. And there's good things and bad things. And, yeah. And um, I think if we, we don't forgive people for their mistakes, we're not better than them. Yeah. We're doing the same thing he, he was doing to others yeah. at that time. Yeah, it's, it's a very inter- interesting perspective. Why do you think, I mean, we don't want to make the show all about him, but was it because he just wanted to win so badly? He was, was he so competitive, so driven, so focused? And, I mean, we've heard it said a lot before. Everyone else was taking it. Lance was just doing it better. Yeah, I mean... He was extremely competitive person. Yeah, that's that's for sure. When he wanted something, he made sure it will happen. Yeah, and it did happen. Uh, so his training, his determination, everything was like top notch. And but then, if you think about what he was doing to other people to, well, actually defend himself. Yeah. Um, when there's so much money at stake, I think you have to do it in some yeah. way. Um, because, yeah, you have to defend yourself. And, and he went, many times he went um, a little bit too far. Yeah. And, uh, of course, uh, we saw the result of that <laughs> <laughs> in 2012-13. Yeah. Yeah, it's very, very interesting. Let's move on from Lance Armstrong and get back to the main man, Yanni Bragovic. Mate, racing for Discovery must have, when you first got there, I know you're quite realistic and stuff, but you must have been thinking, as in cycling, the pinnacles are the Grand Tours, the Tour de France, the Giro d'Italia, the Vuelta. How did it go for you? What was what was the experience like in maybe the first couple of years as a as a pro rider in, in the strongest team in the world? It was really nice uh, in the first so from August to October um, they made me race a lot actually <laughs> yeah. I think I did uh, 20, 24 race days in twenty eight days something like that so I was doing three stage races. Uh, so the whole Grand Tour, basically, uh, I was the only one who was doing that. All the other riders were were different. Um, Why was that? Uh, usually with, with professional teams or World Tour teams, Pro Continental teams, at the end of the year, you'll have some riders that are sick, some are injured, some are just not fit. Yeah. So they try to fill in those gaps with... Uh, well, riders who are available, and I was that rider. And I didn't really um, care because I was excited. I wanted to race. Yeah. Um, and to be honest, uh, I think uh, I did pretty well, and uh, I got, I think, 11th at the World Championships in yeah. the time trial and the road race. So it worked out pretty well for me yeah right and then in 2006 i had a really good season uh finishing top five in three or four uh really big stage races yeah um so yeah yeah it was pretty pretty nice and uh being so young uh, there's also a factor which plays a big role you don't have any worries you a little bit fearless yeah and also like there's cycling there's rest and nothing else really you don't have family you don't have kids you don't have kids in school you don't have mortgages yeah nothing There's life's no pretty straightforward yeah exactly and, and back then of course mate there you weren't you, you would have been but there wasn't an opportunity to be social media star to be the whole day flicking instagram facebook was something you check maybe once a week if so if you had facebook it wasn't like now if people didn't have facebook or instagram you're like what's wrong with you like you don't have those things whereas back then if you had it you were a little bit like oh, what are you doing over there so your whole 
your whole focus could be singular, right? That must have been quite, when you look back now, that's very unique. Yeah, exactly, exactly. And I think it made a, a big difference because the only thing we had uh, also during races, the only thing was TV. And, right. and if you're somewhere in the France, in the middle of nowhere, the TV has four or five channels. Yeah. So there's <laughs> nothing to watch. Yeah. You could read a book and that's actually pretty pretty beneficial for yeah. a rider. But other than that, there was nothing else. Really? We, we were just uh, hanging out, talking to each other. And, um, it sounds like an alien thought, doesn't yeah, it? Yeah, exactly. Just out <laughs> right, having, right. Having a yeah, chat. Yeah. Yeah, it's, it's very interesting. Mate, continue the journey a little bit for us. In, in 2008, you ch- or end of 2007, you changed teams. And, and then as it kind of goes with cycling with a, lot of, with a lot of the riders, team changes are not unusual. It's, it's, it's more unusual that we see riders stay at the same team for a long period of time. Talk us through that and maybe some of the changes that you went through because then your career started to get, I think, a lot more interesting as well. Yeah, in 2008, I joined um, Team Astana. Yeah. Uh, because I actually had a contract for a year or two more at Discovery, but Discovery decided, uh, Discovery, they decided not to sponsor the team anymore. So right. the team was folding, and um, I signed a contract with uh, Team Astana, and that, that was quite a change uh, in, in the team mentality. Yeah. Uh, going from american based team to to eastern european based team yeah. um, actually asian team um, it was quite a shock and uh, and um, i was struggling in the in the beginning of the year uh, right i wanted too much too soon and uh, i got overtrained and um, then i wasn't racing for four months i think they right. left, left me at home just to recover and but then slowly things started getting better and at the end of the season i actually performed really well i got uh, second place in uh, lombardia which yep. is a very very hard and very well respected race in in italy yeah one day race which i'm not uh, a specialist for yeah these kind of races so yeah that was that was 2008 when who was the who was the main rider in Astana then was it Vinic- it was Vinokurov or was it in 2008 we had uh, no we had Kluden yeah Andreas and, uh, Kluden Levi Leipheimer Leipheimer yeah. Yeah. yeah yeah interesting so you were only there you were only there for the season and then you another change right no I was there for two seasons okay uh, 2008 and 2009 and yeah. then in 2010 um we went back to american based team uh team radio shack right wh- which was run again by johan brunil uh so he got you back yeah yeah um he was actually still um i was always following him also 2008 and 9 he was uh general manager of that team right uh but um the 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 strings were pulled by by other people, so um, he wasn't the, the the guy who was managing everything. Right. Actually, yeah. But this is when it got a little bit more interesting for you. You had great time here and 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 won some pretty big pretty big race in the Criterium de Dauphiné, right? Yeah. Yeah. Talk to us a little bit about that. So in 2010, I wanted my my goal was to do the tour. Yeah. Um, Tour de France. Uh, yeah. And is that, sorry, mate, to jump in. Is that the pinnacle? Is that what every professional cyclist wants to race? Yes. Right. That's, for cycling, that's like the Olympics. Yeah. And if you ask me what's better or what's more important for a yeah. cyclist winning Olympics or the Tour, definitely the Tour. Right. Definitely. So that was my goal. And, uh... Uh, that year, I was racing quite a lot. So a month before, before the tour, I did. I still had no answer if I'm going to the tour or not. Wow! And that a month before, yeah, <laughs> maybe more. Mm. And then uh, I talked to to Johan, general manager, uh, at the tour of California, and he said, "Well, we don't know. It's 
highly unlikely. Right. So <laughs> I went home with a plan, and uh, I said to myself, I have to get really, really strong for the Dauphiné and perform well, and maybe they'll they'll choose me. Yeah. And this is exactly what happened. But uh, there was there was one thing before the Dauphiné. I was sick for a week. Right. Uh, I have uh, GI problems. I couldn't eat. Uh, whatever I ate, uh, sit in my stomach for the whole day. So training wasn't really what I needed. Yeah, right. But I still went out for four days. I did four days, five hours, no food. <laughs> no wow. food. And it got to the point where after four hours, I had to stop every 15 minutes to rest Wow! because I was, I was done. I was finished. Wow. And then I think I was mentally so strong yeah. that I knew the race is coming. And suddenly, three days before the race, things started to change. My wow. digestion started working. And then the next day... I did this training, really hard training, um, with the friends of, uh, with my friends behind the car on a climb, <coughs> and after five minutes of climbing, I just saw the numbers, and my feelings yeah. were like like never before, and I said, okay, that's it, I'm going home, and I knew I was ready. Really. Uh, and that Dauphiné race, that's the only race that. In eight days, I had no pain at all. I wow. was never in trouble, never, never. Really? So that's so far that that's been the only race in my career that was the easiest and the most successful race. And I mean, mate, in that race, you're up against some pretty, pretty tough competition as well. Yeah, yeah, uh, uh, for sure. I mean, that's that's the race that. Uh, as let's say mini Tour de France, yeah, we, we could call uh, uh, call it, um, and you have all the the, the big guys, yeah. at this race testing the form, uh, trying to get a decent result for just for confidence and and, and um, for the tour. And uh, there was Contador, so who was a former Tour de France champion, exactly, yeah. and um, he really wanted to drop me. Everywhere possible, but uh, were you just like in his pocket the whole time? Yeah, yeah. I was, uh, and I think I, I, um, I made him really, really nervous at times <laughs> because I was just playing playing it cool, and uh, he got really nervous a few times. But on the other hand, if I got to do it again, I would play it differently yeah. because uh, there were two stages. That I let him win, right? And if I had the chance to do it again, I I wouldn't do that. Why did you let him win? Who let someone win, mate? <laughs> because my long-term uh, goal was to win the race overall, right? And not the stage, right? And because we didn't have uh, a strong enough team at the race, yeah, I was afraid that you'd run out of gas. Exactly, that yeah. my team wouldn't be capable of defending my jersey and right. uh, yeah so I played it safe more the strategic side of cycling which we could probably sit here and talk about for hours maybe we should do another show where we do a Tour de France special because I think this is what makes cycling so special isn't it the fact that it's so strategic there's so much going on you have eight riders in a team some day you might go out and there might be three of them have dropped out of the race so you have five and there's certain tactics time trialists all of that and it's that that's what i think sometimes when people look at cycling and saying like tour de france a three-week race and how can it be interesting for three weeks i think if you actually really start to understand it it's a race every single day and then like you say some days you have to maybe let someone go to save some energy so you can come in but that's something for another time the point was that you went to the dauphiné to prove a point and to get selected for that year's Tour de France, what happened? After the, the race, the next day, I got a message from Lance asking me if I want to do the, the tour. 
I said, of course. Directly? And that was it. Really? Yeah. Where, where's yeah. Johan? <laughs> He's supposed to be the manager. <laughs> huh? uh, Johan and, uh, and Lance were always talking to each other, like, every day, multiple times a day. So, right. um, yeah, I mean... Lance came directly to me, asked me, and and decision was done. Do you think that is maybe something, like you were saying earlier, about how he genuinely cared for his riders, how he gave you that mobile phone to call your mom on on her birthday? He wanted that personal touch for to almost to invite you in rather than getting Johan to do it? Yeah, for sure. For sure. Interesting. Yeah. And was that part, do you think that was part of his bigger game plan for selfish reasons? Or I know we've gone back to him, but it's an interesting tactic, huh? No, I think he was always aware that if he treats his riders really well, they'll give 100% yeah. for him. Yeah. And uh, he, he never thought that having a rider on the team is just the rider's job to help him. Yeah. He always took care of of us of the riders yeah. and uh, I think it paid off for him many times how did it feel getting that call uh, to be honest I actually expected it really yeah yeah I love yeah, it yeah. because uh, in the world of cycling it would be strange to have a Dauphine winner not being at the tour yeah okay uh, you know so you'd kind of ridden your way into the yeah, team yeah yeah and also, everybody knew that I was not going to be doing the tour for, for myself. It right. was going to be for, for Lance, because Lance was the... Talk the to us a little bit about that, mate. You've got this call from one of the leaders in, in the sport, essentially to, like we were saying just a little bit there before, to ride for him. Your job was to go to the Tour de France and support and help him. How does that feel? Um, honestly, I didn't think about it too much. Right. I, I knew that um, what my job is going to be. Yeah. And, and that was it. Um, I worked uh, really well to prepare myself yeah. uh, for the tour, and that was it. That was it. How did the tour go? Uh, it didn't go that well <laughs> for him because at the very same, same time, uh, there were some allegations made against him, yeah. and he got really, you could feel that, um, you could see it also on his face that he's, uh, he was not calm and, uh, and, and ready to race. Uh, yeah. Yeah. So uh, he crashed on stage five, I think, yeah. once and then twice, and then everything was over. Right. Yeah. So did you continue to ride? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, he also fin- we all finished the race, but uh, we were out of uh, GC, out of the the battle for the win. So just a good bit of training through France. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Mate, moving on, the next year, 2012, you move back to Team Astana, and this is I don't know if you think so, but I, it's probably was probably one of your more successful years on riding Grand Tours. Talk to us a little bit about that that year. Well, 2012 actually started pretty bad for me. Yeah. Um, it was a new team. Again, different mentality, different way of working. Um, Italian general manager, they're very, very loud, I yeah. would say. Yeah. And um, I was kind of sad right. to, to see how, how the things work there. And uh, in the beginning of the season, uh, first race, there was this guy in the car and he yelled at the riders and, and, and calling them names and everything for nothing. Just because three guys were ahead, 200k stage, and they had eight minutes. There was no danger. Right. And, uh, and at the end of the stage, I, uh, I called the general manager asking if we could uh, cancel the contract. Wow. Yeah. Uh, that didn't happen. And then a few months later, I was at the tour, and everything was going pretty well. Yeah. Uh, crashed a few times. That, that year, the tour was really hectic. Yeah. A lot of crashes, a lot of nervousness. But um, in the end, I managed to get ninth. 
Yeah. I was ninth, right? Yeah, you I were think. ninth, mate. Yeah. Well, according to uh, my notes, I'm not sure yeah. if they're right and, or wrong. And, and considering I lost a lot of time uh, being behind the crash, the road was blocked, and I, I think I lost three minutes that day. Yeah. If uh, that hadn't happened, I'd be sixth in general, wow. which is pretty good result. So, mate, yeah. It's incredible. Yeah. yeah. So, yeah. <laughs> I don't know. Was it the, was that one of the highlights after obviously the World Championships when when you were starting your career? But was this you know we're we're ten years later now and you're in the top ten in the pinnacle of the sport in the Olympics of cycling. Yeah, you say it quite casually, mate, but it must have meant a lot to you. Honestly, yeah. No, because <laughs> I had I had a bigger plan, which was what being even better than ninth. Wow. I I believe at the time I was capable of top five if right. things went perfectly. And that's one of my regrets. But honestly, I don't regret anything because past is past. Yeah, right. we, we, we need to move forward. Um, but uh, my mistake was always... Uh, not living in the moment and right. not enjoying my success. After that tour, the two days after, I was already in London at the Olympics, and there right. was no celebration. There was nothing. There was one press conference, and that that's it. Wow! And the, and the next week, I was already racing in in London. Wow! And then after London, I was spend a week at home. Yeah. And I flew to Colorado. Wow doing another race do you think that's changed a little bit now do you live more in the moment now i think so i'm i'm more aware of myself and uh, more aware of uh, what i have and what i appreciate and what's important for me and my family and my friends yeah um and and uh I think I'm happier now. Uh, You're always happy when I see yeah. you, mate. <laughs> no, I'm happy because meeting you is, to be honest, and, and, and you, not to... Uh, the, the thing with me is when I'm around you, yeah. I always get in good mood and <laughs> always start thinking positively. And, oh, that's and, cool. and, and, and uh, I really like being around you. Thanks, mate. Appreciate yeah. that. Mate, we could obviously, we played out a lot of your career. We could, we could keep talking about it. What I want to do is I want to fast forward a little bit and I want to talk about two more things before we wrap it up. One thing you might be or you might not be comfortable talking about, but in 2018, you were involved in a drug scandal which saw you suspended from cycling. Do you have any comments to share with us? <laughs> you, you're more than welcome to say no. Yeah, of course. Or do you want to defend I mean, your case? I mean, and it's because it's it's quite interesting. But I, I want to sort of preface this a little bit. In in you know you're you're 35 years old now. You know it's. It, I'm not saying it's towards the end, but you, you'd been in a lot of stuff before, and then this case came around in 2018 where yeah. you weren't really racing, you weren't attached to a team but you're still a pro rider, so you're available for drug testing. You got tested, and tell us the story if you want to, man. Yeah, so um, I got tested uh, 2018 in April during during one of the races. And uh, the results of the test came out in late July, so... It took them quite a few months to yeah. to process it, it. but um, the ironic thing is I got positive for a type of stimulant, which is um, basically useless. <laughs> it does not enhance performance. The reason it uh, it's banned is that it's um, it's not healthy. It's dangerous for the health. It rises blood pressure. Right. Uh, but it's banned as as a stimulant. It's banned. Right. So which you knew, I knew, of course. Right. And then uh, I had no idea how this got into my system. So I started researching my supplements um, extensively, and I figured out there was one supplement from the company that also produced the 
pre-workout with that particular ingredient. Right. And that was the only reason that it could get into my system. So it was uh, a tainted supplement. Uh, but this being three three months after I used it, I had no product anymore. I had nothing. Right. So there was no way to prove it. Yeah. And of course, I, I tried my best to 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 make them realize what has happened. Yeah. Because uh, also the the quantity of of that substance in my uh, urine was eighty to hundred times less than than if it was uh, intentionally taken right, right. Or to to improve performance. Um, so yeah, that was it. I mean, there's many people that believe me. There's many people that uh, say that uh, I was trying to cheat, or yeah. Uh, but I at the, at the same time, I understand everybody, and uh, the sport of cycling doesn't have a, a, a very good uh, <laughs> track record. Not at all. Uh, so it's very understandable. How many times in your career have you had drug tests? Do you think? I would say probably 200 times. 200, 200 times. 200 times urine and then because out of competition testing, yeah, it's usually urine and blood. Right. In competition, it's most of the time it's urine only. Right. So over 14 years, you'd had over 200 Drug yeah, tests. for sure, for sure. Why do you think they came to test you in a period that you were? Uh, because you, you, if I get this right, you were off contract with Bahrain, right. Marie. You, I was racing for a team, for a continental team. Right. So the thing was because the year before I was racing with um, World Tour team. Yeah. I was on the um, included in the. Um, testing pool yeah so you had to provide them with your whereabouts yeah right when you're available for testing for each day yeah and uh, so that was in April but the last time I was tested was December in 2017 so there was four months right without the testing so I knew I was going to be tested in uh, during the race for right. sure because right. four, four months without testing is yeah. is so a little long. this is what, and I know why you say that. It makes it even more. It almost protests your 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 or states your innocence that you knew that this test was going to come. Yeah, for sure, for sure. I I knew it, and and also uh, that was my first race after I had my um, kneecap broken. Yeah. So I was a nice one. <laughs> yeah, I, I wasn't in shape at all. I was yeah. I was okay, but there was no. There was no intention to race for the for the podium. Right. So even if if I use that supplement or even if it improved the performance, I yeah. would be maybe twentieth in, instead of twenty fifth, right. which means nothing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. For such a huge risk. It's interesting, mate, because whilst obviously the story and the, the your case, how you stated there, very simply, obviously in in, in a couple of minutes. You know, I think half the listeners, because it's cycling and there's been a lot around it, like you said, will go, yeah, sounds like a good story, buddy, nice one, cross-contamination. But when you start to look at other stuff, it's, yeah, you can understand that maybe there was a mistake. However, you will, and, and this, is, this is my question, really, it's written in Wikipedia, it's in the paper, you are, which I want to go on to in a minute, you're in the British press recently, you've been, you've been banned for drug use. Yes. How does that sit with you? Well, uh, to be without, honest, without trying to upset you at all. No, like no, 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 no. It's it's. I totally understand. I mean, and uh, it was my responsibility, yeah. uh, and I know the rules. Uh, whatever you take in uh, into your body, it's your responsibility, no matter what it says on the label. Yeah. Uh, so it's um, it was totally my my fault yeah but that doesn't mean that uh it was intentional yeah and um i'm fine with that i can live with that uh i know that 
it was not my uh, intention to do it. Yeah. And uh, I can live with that. If yeah, cool. uh, if it was the the other way around, uh, I would probably feel way worse. We're not Lance Armstrong here. <laughs> That's what we're saying. I think like we said on the, when we were riding this morning, though, mate, time is the healer at the time. I know you were quite stressed about it. We spoke a lot during those times, and, you know, it's it's you are quite a genuine person, so it's tough when the media can print one side of the story, but not many people know you well and, and can understand yeah. that. I still believe you, mate, especially the way Thank that you, you told me. I'll never forget the night we were sat in, what was it, outside Cafe Nero in Motor City and that damn kid was just coming up and down on the scooter and we we're trying to speak about something important. Leading on from that, mate, and for those folks who are in the UK or follow my Instagram because I think I put it there, just recently the UK tabloids picked up on, on you for, for almost two things, really. One thing was a, and this was in the Daily Mirror, and you told me this morning, it's also in Men's Health. You've posted some, some things on your own Instagram recently, which I actually, at the time, didn't think anything of. You posted a picture of, of, of your leg. It was incredibly vascular. You've been training super hard. You've had a few years of, let's say, up and downs, and now you're, you're ready to race. And the UK media got hold of it, talked about how unhealthy it was because you were so lean, and obviously spoke about your your recent drug ban as well. I, I mean, how was that, mate? It must have just been it must have been a weird time. Yeah, I mean, it was it was weird, but um, I'm not really paying much attention. Nice, right? yeah. because um, I care about things that are important for me and that uh, will make a difference for me in my life um, yeah people say crazy things and 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 I understand that uh, that uh, journalism can be good and bad and uh, people will do everything for a little bit of uh, exposure but uh, yeah um, I'm not I'm not really stressed about it so yeah yeah Interesting, isn't it? Mate, I know you have to be somewhere. We could literally continue to talk for, I think, hours. We need to get you back on pre-Tour de France early next year, next time you're in Dubai. But, for sure. mate, it's, you have an incredible story. Folks that want to learn more, all of my show notes were taken from Wikipedia. Just put Yanni into Wikipedia. Actually, your real name is Yanez. Yeah, he's, he's I, 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 don't, I don't use it and I hate it. <laughs> you don't use I, it, yeah. Seriously. So if you're looking for Yanni, I'm going to put a link to the Wikipedia page all about him in the show notes. Go and read about him. Send him a message on Instagram. He's super intelligent. I haven't even got halfway into where I wanted to get with all of this knowledge that you have now. Some things we're talking about on the bike this morning. But, mate, I want to acknowledge you. I want to thank you, mate, for, for everything you've done for me. You helped me a lot in cycling as well. And, and also for speaking so openly on, on the show. I think, you know, when we talk about cycling, drug scandals and all that stuff, a lot of people are like, ooh, there's a big taboo. But I think you, you seem like a super honest guy and hopefully people get a better idea. So, mate, thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thanks for having me. Awesome. Have a great day. Thank you.